Blavatsky wrote, as to the practical results to be obtained by the investigations of geometry, very fortunately for students who are coming upon the stage of action, we're no longer forced to content ourselves with mere conjectures. George Felt may one day be recognized as the greatest geometer of the age. I'm not going to go through this because I think it's worth your while to see. I mean, this is very important. Um, well, let me just do a little quick. The fundamental diagram to which all science of elementary geometry, both plane and solid, is referable to produce arithmetical systems of proportions in a geometrical manner to identify this figure with the remains of architecture and sculpture in this exact manner. Egyptians had used it as the basis of all their astronomical calculations, their religious symbolism, and so forth. We're going to keep going. Now, there's the belief, Zirkoff, in his notes to Isis Unveiled, he believes that there's no trace ever has been found of this unpublished manuscript. Uh, we're not so sure about that. And, of course, if any of you are interested or have uh, knowledge about this, uh, this felt group of which I'm a part, please let me know. We do have, for example, this image of a, a card that went out, the Greek canon of proportion, um, the Kabbalah of the Egyptians written up atop by the Belton Company. Now, where I first came across this, to be honest with you, was Claude Bragdon and the Beautiful Necessity. They did an exhibit up at the, up at the University of Rochester at the library up there. And here's Claude Bragdon, who designed this building here, and here's what he writes. This is important. Um, Bragdon, whose dodecahedron and icosahedron are outside here, wrote to an artist friend on September 15, 1936, regarding a fortuitous meeting with Viola di Guici, who had received from a doctor that she was uh, uh, being attended by uh, part of a manuscript. We, we don't know how much. Um, from Felt. I have met several New Delphic sisters, some of whom are remarkable indeed, in particular Viola de Guici. She studied art with Derman Ross and Giles, and she has dis rediscovered the canon of proportions of the old Egyptians in an old manuscript which came to her in the queerest way. Felt had devoted his entire life to this research, but a fragment was destroyed in the Boston fire. That fragment was given her by a doctor. Uh, apparently that fragment survived the fire, I think is what's meant here. Some of the things she showed me were very impressive, new and direct ways of getting the root rectangles of the circle, root 2, root 3, root 5, and the golden section everywhere appears. Um, now I'm going to have to leave you time for questions, so I'm just going to run through some images very quickly here for you to take a gander at. I'm not going to show you images that I do have possession of that are of Felt's work, but Hambage was important to their development. So this is Jay Hambage. These are his root rectangles. They're in my little golden section book. This is also on the cover of my book. Uh, and here's Da Vinci and how he would divide things up using a root five rectangle. Uh, Michelangelo's works with Robert Hupka analyzing them. You can see it. Felt mentions the Apollo Belvedere. We see, now these, these we begin to see my friends, um, uh, Lance Harding's work, his analysis of the Venus de Milo. The Dory Forest is the biggie, and that was the canon of Polyclitus, which has been destroyed. We have some fragments. We see it with the Egyptians. We see it with the golden mandala applied to the Dendera Zodiac. Cesario Anno did it. If you look closely, you'll see that the Naval is cutting them at the golden ratio, Da Vinci, Munich, Kuros. Sometimes you'll see this is eight units tall, and um, at three units and five units here, so five is to three will be the ratio, phi in the Zeising, Apollo Belvedere, Desidorius Lens, golden ratio again there. You see it with uh, Lance Harding's work that he did for my book. You see it in the Egyptian canons here. Here, in fact, where they did is they went to the top up here. This would be 18 is to 11. If you look at Lucas' numbers, you'll find that. This was the second Egyptian canon. Tom Bruns does it as well. And then here's my book. And then later I worked with Alexei Stakov, Mathematics of Harmony. This is an outstanding book. I only assisted him. But here's the last point we need to make. 
The golden section is not a product of mathematical imagination, but the principle of the laws of equilibrium, according to De Lubitsch, as you saw, but in the Mahatma letters, here it is. Plato, by the way, is a fifth rounder coming from the future to teach us in the present. We recognize but one law in the universe, the law of harmony of perfect equilibrium. Uh, Mahatma letter number 70, Katumi, in chronological order. Here is the Buddhist middle way. It's at the Golden Cut. Um, a divine Proportion, that's my upcoming book. And the Golden Section of the Roots of Theosophy. Okay, we've got a little bit of time for questions. I think I got it pretty close to our hour, I hope. Okay, uh, questions. Please, please wait for a microphone. Oh. If you have a question, raise your hand. Got him stunned. Uh, why aren't you in danger of being killed? <laughs> well, now that you mention it live on. Uh, <laughs> um, well, I do know people that um, have figured out things similar and they've been told they can't publish. I've tried, tried until tonight to stay under the, <laughs> the wire. Uh, I have been told by one of my teachers that, um, you know, what am I doing? If Plato was unwilling to do it openly, what the heck are you doing? Well, my take on that is it's time for what is, was esoteric to become exoteric. world is really in, in a dire state of affairs, and I think by putting this stuff out there, I think we do a favor to the world, uh, but that's my two cents on that. Other questions? Um, I don't know who gave the description. Um, I think it was Alcott that he described the basic uh, figure that Felt was working with, the circle in a square, in a triangle, and there's an Egyptian thing. And Two Egyptian triangles, and yes, a pentagon, yeah. and a cube. And a cube. Yeah, which is Did your place. Felt group try to reproduce what, what he was seeing because I, I know from a discussion somewhere on a theosophical site that, that was kind of a mystery. What, what is this figure that he was uh, uh, describing? I've come across several, very good question, I've come across several figures, uh, drawings by uh, Bragdon as well as Viola de Guici. Sometimes we're unsure. We know some that are signed by Bragdon. Um, those really have not come out in the public domain. That's why I've been very careful tonight to honor the group that I'm working with. I could have just as well shown them to you, but I decided, no, uh, it's better just to kind of keep things under wraps for the moment. But it will be published, and I've seen two really incredible drawings that seem to link those very things that you were talking about. And what happens is it's very much like the last book in the last, probably the last theorem of uh, Euclid, uh, where he's uh, comparing the ratios of the cube and the icosahedron and the tetrahedron and their faces. And what they're doing is they're getting root two, root three, root five, and they're building it into one image that is just absolutely stunning. And what they've done, what they did, and I'm sure Felt did the same thing, is they've color-coded it. So the square, for example, they've got in, I think that's green. Um, and uh, the Pentagon is, they use yellow, they use different colors. And so that helps you to draw out of the image, you begin to see what in fact they're getting at. So again, a short answer to you is there looks like there is some material there, and I've seen quite a few drawings, but there's a couple. Perhaps um, maybe on Saturday, those of you who come for the workshop, we'll, 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 you know, I can do the drawings, we can take a look at some of that. Okay. Yes, ma'am. I can understand the societies of ancient peoples, why secrecy maybe was necessary, because I don't know why. But anyhow. But in this day and age, do they think that daffodils are going to turn purple or something if this is revealed? Well, the <clears throat> best way I can answer that is uh, Michael Barron, a good friend of mine, who did these uh, geometric um, platonic and Archimedean solids. You can, we're going to do this on Saturday, use some of his models and put them together. He went to Los Alamos to do a kind of workshop on how people can work together using the different solids. 
And he, he couldn't believe it. There's a big gasp across the audience. And they thought, oh, my God, he has found some of the most classified information that we have. Because if you look at nuclear detonation, you're going to find that the same things that build nature up, um, the creative is also the destructive. Like Heraclitus said, the way up and the way down are one and the same. So the, in that sense, perhaps some people would construe them as being very, very dangerous. I mean, they are, they're the creative power of the universe itself, but also Shiva, the destructive power. And I don't mean Shiva in a bad sense, but yeah, yeah. Exactly, yes. And that's what we're hoping for. And, and well, and, and some think that we're coming to the end of a cycle. And much of the stuff, you know, that I now understand about Krishnamurti and the avatar, the bodhisattva expression that came through him, that, uh, I mean, he didn't turn his back on that. Now we know that he was overshadowed during his life. Um, and he and those who describe this will talk about the cycles, these grand cycles and these sh shorter cycles. Uh, Aryal Sanat, I think, is the name of one of the authors who's very, very good on that subject. And so we may be at the end of a cycle that is the beginning of a new cycle, and those are the times in which we probably need to bring the mysteries out into the open. That's, you know, I, I did, I should say, I did have that one teacher, he said, well, you know, you realize the karmic consequences of this. Well, again, it's, we need to bring this out and to share it. And, and this is part of the patrimony of the Theosophical Society. That's why I'm here, is to try to help reintroduce what already has been here all along. Thank you. Thanks. Any, there we go. It's from the Lama. The mandalas you're creating are awakening consciousness, and they need to be done properly. Otherwise, you end up with uh, disorganization, you know. So, uh, sacred's good. You know? Yes. Um, so, a good point that the mandalas themselves are representations of the cosmos mm -hmm. and of life and consciousness. Liberation and they, through seeing. Absolutely. And so, they, that's why when we do sacred geometry, we do it as a spiritual practice. And it's done very, very carefully. It's really a kind of meditative technique because you are learning the, the interrelationships that uh, the divine has used, whatever that is or however it works, and we're kind of mimicking it in the process. So I agree with you. That is a very sacred act and has to be taken very, very uh, uh, with, with great uh, precision. Sacred, not secret. Sacred. Okay. Okay. That's, that's a good way to put it. Thank you. <laughs> 